uh, learned at my father's appointment. Um, sometime in early May of 1945, um, just before President Truman signed the executive order appointing him as uh, the United States Chief Counsel for the prosecution of major Nazi war criminals. And I learned about it from him. And uh, he asked me what I thought of it. And I said, uh, how are you going to do that and also do your judicial duties? And he said, well, I'll have to take a leave of absence, but it won't be very long. <laughs> and uh, he thought about it, he talked to my mother, and he decided to do it. Did you have a sense that he was enthusiastic about the proposition? Very much. Yeah. Uh, is it also a time at which the court is getting a little hairy and a little respite from it wouldn't hurt? That was true, too. What were you doing at the time? I was uh, an ensign in the Navy attached to the Bureau of Ships Office of General Counsel in Washington. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Um, in going over your, your father's uh, oral history and uh, also a biography done by a guy named Gerhardt, uh, it talks about being sounded out by Judge Rosen yes. for the job only about a couple of weeks after FDR's death. Um, but neither your father nor Gerhardt uh, gets at all into why Harry Truman wanted Bob Jackson. Do you have a sense of that? Yes. Um, my father got to know <coughs> then Senator Truman when he was chairman of a Senate committee doing some kind of an investigation. I forgot exactly what. I think it was something to do with the um, supply side of the Second World War. I think it was war profiteering. Something, something that like nature. that. I don't remember exactly. And um, after he became president, I'm sorry, while he was chairman of that committee, which had just been formed, Senator Truman asked my father <coughs> whom he would recommend to be the general counsel of the committee. Yeah. And my father recommended Hugh Fulton. Hugh Fulton was given the job, performed very creditably, and uh, Mr. Truman, I think, felt a debt of gratitude to my father for having recommended Hugh Fulton. And then, <clears throat> if you remember, in April, I think, of 1945, my father made an address before the American Society of International Law about the trial of war criminals, uh, which received a good deal of press attention, and I think that, that obviously came to the attention of Sam Rosenman. So I think the combination of the Fulton experience and the yeah. American Society of International Law speech probably led to the decision to ask my father to take on this assignment. Uh, he, he started putting together a team um, soon thereafter. <coughs> And some of these people, I understand how they came to be uh, recruited. Some I'm not quite so sure. What, 
what did Justice Jackson, uh, what was his relationship with the Sidney and Alderman that he wanted, Mr. Alderman? Uh, well, Sidney Alderman, I think, was the general counsel of the Southern Railway. And he had argued a number of cases before the Supreme Court. And my father was impressed with him as a lawyer and as an advocate. Uh, and I think that's the reason he chose him. How does your dad approach you, Bill, about your coming on board? How does he put it to you? What's he say he hopes you can do for him? Well, he said that he would need a lot of help that he um, wanted to have someone who would be his assistant <coughs> and whom he could uh, have complete confidence and trust. And uh, as I had just um, gotten out of law school and graduated from law school, and been admitted to the bar, he thought that this might be an interesting experience for me, and that's where I'd like to do it. And, uh, I thought about it for a while, discussed it with my then new bride, and uh, in the expectation that we were talking only about a few months. Unique opportunity for a guy just out of law school. It was my first case. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest one I ever had. <laughs> you come out of uh, Washington, you're working for the Navy, <clears throat> a city I think we can say relatively unscarred by the war. Yes. You arrive at Nuremberg. What's your reaction on seeing this place? totally appalled. Of course, I'd seen the pictures, but I didn't realize the extent of the destruction. The rubble, the stench, and the desolation. Um, although there were still standing a number of buildings, including the one that became the, the Palace of Justice. That was relatively unscarred, which became the headquarters of the trial. But it was uh, an appalling first sight. Um, and vestiges of the war remained in the sense that we were uh, cautioned not to drive around in open jeeps because wire was stretched across the road in some areas at about neck, neck level for persons riding jeeps. And at that time, some <coughs> GIs had been killed. It had happened. I, I, I kept coming across rumors of that. It, it, it did happen. Who uh, are these diehard Nazis, do you suppose? I would assume that they were. Um, I was reading in the uh, oral history yesterday how one of your early assignments was to find a house. I think you may have done this with John Benitez and General Gill. Could you reconstruct that mission for me? I really can't, uh, except that I think it was uh, General Gill's primary responsibility, and of course he used uh, Dr. Benitez, I guess he became minor major when he got to help, and certain houses were uh, picked as possibilities. I looked at them and decided that one was uh, preferable to the rest sense that it was, uh, it was set off with surrounding 
grounds that would make it easily protected. Um, and it, was a, it wasn't a large house, but it was adequate. Your father gives a great description of it, uh, and then adds adjectives like appalling, weird, awful taste. Yeah. <laughs> did he kid you about picking this book? Well, I <laughs> suppose he did. But it was the architecture and especially the furnishings were heavy to Connie. Yeah. But it was uh, it was moderately comfortable and there was space for working as well as living space for guards and so forth. One of the key guys is uh, Colonel Story. Yes. Could you give me a thumbnail of Colonel Story? Well, as best I remember, he was a leading lawyer in Dallas, a, a trial lawyer. Um, I think he was also the head of the Southwestern Legal Foundation. I'm not sure of that. But somehow or other, he'd come to my father's attention, and like Mr. Owen, he felt he was a very capable lawyer and advocate, and uh, thought he'd be a good member of the team. He also was, at the time, um, in the Army in some He's a colonel. Colonel. He was a colonel, and I've forgotten whether he was in the Judge Advocate General or, or something else. <clears throat> but I I don't know any more about it than that. Yeah. Any recollection of, of his it's the stories handling documents? You've got a fellow who's handling interrogations by the name of Colonel Amon. Hmm? Any memories of Amon? John Harlan Amon, yes. Right. Um, well, he was a colonel, I believe, in the OSS, and um, had been either a United States attorney in New York or deputy. Right. But anyway, he was an ex-prosecutor. Um, I believe he had a private practice and then went back into the, went into the OSS. And uh, my father had <coughs> known of his activities, I think, as a prosecutor and felt that he would be very helpful in this endeavor. There's a guy who is <coughs> critical in, in, in laying the pipe for this operation that develops the initial strategy by the name of uh, Bernays. And he disappears. Yeah, what happened to him? Well, he was um, in the Judge Advocate General's Corps in the Army, I believe, and had been given early responsibility while the war was going on for helping to plan what would be done about the captured German uh, leaders. Um, and I think he started his work before the decision had been made in favor of trial versus summary disposition. Yes. And he was one of the early planners and did a lot of work on the law applicable uh, and such things as that. And was very helpful in the early stages in negotiating the agreement of London and the charter and the planning for the trial. Um, he was not active in the preparation of the trial, as far as I recall. He was with my father in London during the yeah. Preliminary phases, then they moved to Paris to uh, 
collect documentation and control the names of there. I'm not sure why he wasn't <coughs> active in the preparation and conduct of the trial, but I, I seem to recall that he was not well. And I, I don't think there was any other reason. But that's yeah. a dim yeah. recollection. Right. Uh, there's, a, there's another uh, important figure early uh, in the game, <coughs> and it's Wild Bill Donovan. Yes. Always a fascinating man who your father uh, wisely concludes will be helpful because the OSS has done a good job of organizing evidence even before the end of the war, and Donovan has quite a reputation himself as a lawyer, mm -hmm. former uh, prosecutor. Uh, they, they fall all over honest uh, differences, it strikes me from what I've read. Uh, do you recall, how would I put this, your father's gut feeling about Bill Donovan? Well, I think on a personal level, they were, they were good friends. Um, they'd known each other for many years. Donovan was from upstate New York, as my father was. And, um, he was very helpful, as you say, in, in producing uh, evidence and individuals uh, to assist. And the OSS contributed a lot in both of those areas, but they fell apart on the basic issue of um, whether the trial should be largely a documentary case or, you know, as my father had advocated, or whether um, uh, there should be a parade of stunning witnesses that, as Donovan suggested. And they simply couldn't agree. Yeah. And my father was convinced that uh, the documentary case was unassailable because there were so many documents which were so copious and were signed by the people who, who were charged they couldn't possibly explain them away, and he didn't see the need for parading uh, ex yeah. generals uh, to tell a story that uh, was already told the documents. He puts it in a very good way in, in the papers I was just looking at. He says, documents can't commit perjury, they don't have faulty memories. And they can't be cross-examined. <laughs> But I also have a sense of, go ahead. Well, Donovan said, well, we need some zip to it, you know, something that will you know, catch the headlines. And my father said, what we need is a solid case, and the most solid case is a documentary case. And that's the way it was done. There were a number, of course, of witnesses, but the guts of the case was the documentary captured by the, not only OSS, but the Army had enormous archives in Frankfurt, and the British in their zone had collected a lot of yeah. documents, which were all put together, and it was quite a load of L-O-D-E of, of uh, material. Donovan leaves in something of a huff. That day or soon thereafter, over dinner or wherever, does your father see him? Bill's an awful thin skinned guy, or does he make any observations about him at all? No, I think, I think that uh, maybe there was not only the philosophical difference as to how to try the case, but I think that uh, General Donovan has been perhaps looking for a more of a leadership position in the trials than he was willing to take when it became largely a documentary case. Do you suppose that the the arrangement before this friction was that Donovan would go into court?
court and try cases? Is that the expectation? I'm not sure that that was ever expressed. It may have been his expectation. As, a, as, a, as an old speechwriter myself, uh, I was very uh, moved by uh, Justice Jackson's opening statement, mm -hmm. which uh, he describes uh, in, in great detail how he went about preparing himself for it in the oral history. <coughs> uh, what do you remember about watching your dad gear up for that opener? Well, he spent an awful lot of time on it, and uh, like everything that he did, um, he wrote his own stuff. Now, he did, he did obviously have materials that were furnished to him by the staff and, and suggestions for us. But he put it together himself. Spent many a long hour at it. And it was revised considerably until he was satisfied with it. Over breakfast or in the car over dinner, would he ever say, Bill, I want you to take a look at this and yes, show did. you a chunk of it? Yes, he did. Yeah, I looked at it. Gave him my thoughts for what they were worth. Fledgling lawyer at that time. And, uh, he accepted some, he rejected some, made up his own mind. Uh, before major occasions like that opener, which your father describes as the most important <coughs> thing he ever did in his life, um, before a moment like that, this is a, a rather impassioned man, you know, a very strong character. Is he cool? Is he uptight? How, how does he behave just before going into the ring on something that important? Well, um, I think he was uptight maybe in the course of preparing it. You know, and everything he said, he would read over himself this right, and I overstated it, and I understated it. But when he put it together and knew what he was going to say, I think he was very serene about it. Um, he did have fire in his belly when he delivered it, you know, I'll tell you that. He's not uh, overjoyed that Harry Truman picks Biddle for the court. He asks Biddle to get over as soon as possible. Biddle takes a ship. Um, Biddle recruits an administrator for the court, a general who outranks Gill and creates a lot of administrative headaches. What did your father express uh, about Francis Biddle? Privately. And I can go off the record and not for attribution, however you want to answer that. Well, I'd rather go off the record on this. Okay. For a big moment. Of, well, let me, well, let me back up again. What was your reaction in relationship to uh, uh, Mr. Biddle? I didn't have much. Uh, I didn't know him that well. Um, I think he was doing his job as best he could. Um, as I say, we didn't we didn't mingle with yeah. the court. Didn't yeah. see them very yeah. much. Uh, another dramatic moment for the chief prosecutor is the point at which he's going to uh, cross-examine Herman Gary. And your father describes this in interesting detail in his papers. Uh, again, uh, on the eve of this job, <coughs> does he discuss it with you? Does he behave in any memorable manner? No, he had. Uh, well, he he did discuss it with me and and um, discuss the outlines of. questions that he proposed to him to, uh, to pose. Um, but, you know, it was like preparing any case, which he'd done for years.
years in practice. Um, I don't think he was uptight about it. There he I don't recall any particular trauma. No. You you were have an opportunity to to watch. Uh, uh, Maxwell Fife and work with him, I would imagine, and, and watch the two British judges on the bench. Which of these guys was most impressive to you? Burkett, uh, Lawrence, Maxwell Fife, and later Shawcross. Yes. Well, I have the greatest admiration for David Maxwell Fife. Without peer as an advocate, um, well rounded, good judgment. Um, it was hard to get a sense of Burkett because he was the alternate and had very little to say during the proceedings. Lord Justice Lawrence, um, I thought, was far less impressive than Maxwell Fife. Um, I didn't think he had a sense of the realities that he was dealing with in the courtroom. You're there to watch a number of these bright, uh, then young assistant prosecutors who work under Justice Jackson, uh, Telford Taylor, Drexel Sprecher, Whitney Harris, <coughs> Daniel Margolis. I uh, interviewed a bunch of these guys. Bernard Meltzer, a guy named Barrett, uh, Walter Brudno, a dozen or so. Which ones do you see some star quality? I'd say they were, they were all good. Uh, not all of them um, took a significant part in the actual court proceedings. Many of them only in the, in the preparation. Yeah. But I think they were all good. I think uh, Sprecher and Harris and Barrett. Do you recall whether your father had any particular admiration or antipathy towards certain of the defense counsels? No, I don't. Well, I certainly no antipathy. Uh, I think uh, I think he rather sympathized with many of them who had a very difficult job defending their clients in the face of the incriminating documents. Yeah. I mean, what, nothing they could say <laughs> afterwards could change what the documents said. And I think he felt that most of them were, were professional and doing a good job, doing the best they could with what they had to work with. A psychiatrist whose papers I'm going over, he's dead, he's dead now, in, um, Gustav Gilbert, do you remember him? Yes, I do. What kind of an impression did he make? Well, I don't think he made a very great impression as far as I was concerned. I was never entirely sure of what his role was. engaging to talk to. And I 
quite sure what he was doing. He was, I believe he was, as you say, he was under Anderson's wing and not the prosecution staff. What he, what he was doing in, in the most... Uh, he was writing a book. Yeah, you know, he was getting material. For, he, he sold Anderson on the idea that he should have total access. Yeah. Then he got himself into the court so he could go in and out of the court and he chatted with these guys during the recesses. He got a, a book out. It's a fascinating book. Yeah. But I have a sense that that was his uh, his main objective. There. I think it may have been. Um, along with the opener, the, the uh, Jackson summation is very impressive. Do you recall the um, <coughs> atmosphere surrounding the preparation of the summation, which I guess you had a part in? I did. Small part. Well, it was very much like the preparation for the opening, except that it came at the end of the trial and it was necessary to pull all the strands together based on the yeah. evidence. I mean, the, 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 the opening was a statement of what we expected to prove. The summary was supposed to be a statement of what we had proved. So that there was a, a massive job of culling the record, transcripts of testimony and the documents, um, and organizing it under the various counts of the indictment. It was a big job. And uh, again, my father had a good deal of staff help in putting the, all the fragments together, but then he he wove them into his own tapestry, put his own touch on it completely. Again, many drafts, many long nights, and, uh, and again he, he would let me read his drafts and make comments. Some he accepted and some he rejected. sure that he had anybody else really working with the final drafts, so I'm not sure. Whitney Harris recalls after all these years that in this summation you made a contribution which he still remembered, which I just wanted to double check you. Uh, 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 you suggested a line uh, to explain the general line of defense that the defendants took that they uh, would have us believe that they reigned, but they did not rule. Do you have a recollection of making that contribution? Vaguely, very vaguely. Um, um, it's possible. I, maybe it was one of my pearls that he accepted, but <laughs> there were many of the 12 by the wayside. <laughs> In, in uh, the summation, and I think probably uh, at the opener too, you're sitting at the table yes. while your father's speaking, okay. giving him documents and so on. Have you worked out, have you choreographed this in advance? You, you must have had some. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Well, I, I, yeah, I had my cues. I, I had, I had a, a copy of the, of the speech, and I knew, and certain document was required and I managed to find it put it in front of me. FDR at one point said of your father, Bob's too much of a gentleman for politics. Did you comment on that? <laughs> well, may have been fairly accurate. He was certainly not the backslapper or the clubhouse type politician in any way. I, I don't I don't think he would have enjoyed the campaign. And uh, I don't know what 
you know, are meant, but I think that my father's instinct was always to take the high road, and maybe that set him apart from the politicians that FDR had in mind. I don't Your your father is away from the court. Cases are uh, backing up there. Uh, Justice Chief Justice Stone at, at one point has expressed his disappointment that your father took the job right. in Nuremberg. Uh, at one point, he is quoted as having said that the Nuremberg trial is Bob's legal lynch party. Does your father ever comment on this over dinner at any informal point? His feelings about being absent from the court. Well, he certainly he, he did. He was um, very concerned about it because um, I think in his early conversations with Judge Rosenman, as I've said, the thought was, well, this will be a couple of months and that's it. Uh, and indeed, when he was appointed in May of 45, the court was one month away from the summer recess, a couple of months we had him back in the fall, but it didn't happen that way. Um, he, he was disturbed by the fact that the trial was taking much longer, but yet uh, he who mounts a tiger cannot dismount. There was couldn't quit in the middle of it, and uh, he, he, was, he was disappointed that it was taking so long. He felt he had no choice but to see it through. And uh, as far as it's being a lynch party, uh, I think the record speaks for itself that it was a fair trial. And incidentally, uh, it did take longer than expected, but I think if you realize that from the time of his appointment in May 45, it was only uh, about 16 months until the trial was finished, maybe off a month yeah. or two. Yeah. From the start, which meant, you know, gathering the evidence, interrogating the prisoners, preparing the case, trying the case, having a recess for the court to deliberate, you know, for judgment. No more than 16 or most 18 months. Compare that to some of the trials we have today, not just criminal trials, but antitrust trials on for years and years and years. I think it was a magnificent yeah. performance. Not, not only organizing the case, but you have to create the court. Create the court. Even create the law to some extent. Create the court? Uh, I don't agree with the law that's created. I know Senator Taft had his views. In any event, uh, the logistics of it, uh, I mean, the courthouse had to be repaired. Do you recall where you all were when you get word that uh, Justice Stone is dead? No, I don't. Nuremberg, I guess. Yeah. There, there is, as I understand from the Gerhardt uh, biography, uh, many of your father's friends get in touch with him from the state say, you better come home. Mm -hmm. You recall his reaction to this? Discussions on that subject. Yes, uh, he did have such uh, entreaties, and uh, he decided not to for two reasons. One was that he was in the midst of the trial; he didn't think that it would be at all appropriate to leave. But he was responsible for the operation. And I think the second reason was that he thought it would be unseemly. 
transparent uh, yeah. intent to reject himself. So he didn't. I read a memoir of uh, Maxwell Fife. <coughs> he, he mentions you uh, in a very amiable light and said that at some point there, Bill Jackson was studying the bagpipes. <laughs> That's right. I've forgotten uh, what the occasion was, but um, I guess maybe it was after the trial was over and the court had retired to deliberate for a couple months, and I think there was a party. And the, the Brits produced bagpipers. I was enchanted bagpipers. And uh, my next trip to London, I went to the shop, bought myself a set of pipes, <laughs> bought them back, and tried to. Uh, learned them. I managed to make some noise, but I never was very efficient. How did you unwind? What did you people do at the end of the day? What was your relaxation, social life? Well, there wasn't a hell of a lot when the trial was in progress because when you're in the midst of the trial, you're, you're working until the next day, preparing them, anticipating what not. But uh, well, on weekends, we would uh, take a trip, drive somewhere to Rotenberg, down to uh, the lakes, just north of Munich, <laughs> that sort of thing. Occasionally have a small dinner party. Um, as you probably know, the Grand Hotel was where most everybody, they had a restaurant, and I think on Saturday they had a floor show with a typical German menu of trapeze artists and jugglers and all that stuff. There was a short Christmas vacation, and we, we did take a trip to. Uh, Describe that environment for me. Well, as I as I recall it, uh, my father had an office in the corner of the building on the, whatever it was, second or third floor. And I think I think Mrs. Douglas had a small office next to him. I had the next office. Next to mine was my secretary, Mary Burns. Later became secretary to Chief Justice Berger. That was the immediate group around my father. Is uh, the justices' uh, quarters, are they spare, spartan, lavish? How would you describe it? Certainly not lavish. They're not quite GI, but uh, as I recall, there was a desk. There were all kinds of tables with papers on them, and, uh, a sofa, extra chairs. Not much in the way of decoration, as I recall. Yeah. I guess you had a flag. None of it was very. Major accomplishments of, of the trial, in terms of, of logistics, is the system that's developed of simultaneous interpretation. 
you are dispatched by your father to do something about that. Could you walk me through it? Well, yes. Um, it, was, it was evident from the very beginning that uh, unless we had a system of simultaneous trends, interpretation, that the trial would never end if you had to have consecutive translation. So, uh, my father sent me back to Washington, and I got in touch with Charlie Horsky, who was the, what will I say, the, I guess the head of the Washington branch of this office. And Charlie got in touch with people at IBM, and if I recall, the, this sort of thing, the, the equipment for simultaneous translation was then pretty much in its infancy. But Charlie worked with the IBM people and arranged for them to provide enough equipment, including the earphones for, for the people who were listening. And it was, uh, it was sent over, and um, it was a remarkable head interpreter. John Duster. Duster. That's right. D-O-S-T-E-R-T. Duster. He was a magnificent linguist, and he recruited the, uh, the bodies. came, it worked, it worked very well, it saved a hell of a lot of time. Did, was there anybody from IBM on the scene? They, they were at the installation, yeah. yes, the engineers came over. I don't know, if, I don't think they remained once the system was running. <coughs> Do you remember a young lad who was your father's bodyguard by the name of Fuchs? Morris Fox, they called him. Fox. Thank you. 
quiet out a little, which led Gary to indulge in his own exploration, debating the question. My father thought that that was a, a departure from the normal rules of judicial proceedings, at least as we know them. On that point, I get a strong sense from what I've been reading that he feels that it was Bill who was his problem there. He tells very clearly in, in, in the course of, of, of saying to Gary, answer the question, and he sees Bill lean over to Warren, and then Warren says, well, the witness should be allowed to elaborate with the uh, I think that's right. Bill prompted the Lawrence's trial. When, when, uh, when did your, you and your father shut down your operation, leave me in this? Well, it was, I recall, a day or two after the judgment was announced. We were out of there. We, we were gone by the time of preparing to the time. I'm not sure back, how could you, would you characterize your father's move? It's been a, in some respects, an ordeal, in many respects, a, a successful prosecution. I think he was greatly relieved that it was over. He was uh, satisfied with the result. in a way that there were some acquittals and that the sentences the differentiation. Yeah. For credibility. For credibility as a as a yeah. as a just trial. Although he said he, he says in the paper I just read that he would have preferred a different set of people acquitted and convicted. Mentioning Spear as one he'd just as soon have seen acquitted and uh, shot. shot. We can see it. I guess one of the most reprehensible of the lot. Yeah, yeah. I think that's right. I think, uh, I think we all felt uh, sympathy for Spear, even when we were taken in, but uh, he was the only forthright man in the dock. I think he was the smartest. And I don't mean only at organizing German armament. I think it's understanding the psychology of the environment he was in, how to handle himself. Yeah. Very impressive. Uh, Gary, um, during the preparatory phase of the trial, I was sent with uh, a couple of other officers to during Hunting Lodge, which I think was near Rosenheim in Bavaria, to see whether we could discover any documents. And uh, we knocked at the door, and the door was opened by a lady who turned out to be Emma Berry. Searched the house, and then she said, Go ahead. And we did not find any documents there, but in the attic, we found a number of steamer uh, trucks. Strike green 